Uh, first off, I would like to thank uh, Susan for organizing this, and I'd also like to thank you uh, for being here today. When I was first elected three years ago, one of the themes of my election was is that the silent majority had better stop being silent, or they might not find themselves in the majority any longer. And I truly believe that. I think it's time that, that uh, the silent majority stand up and let their voices be heard, uh, because I can, I can tell you, being up on the Hill, that, that uh, a lot of times we hear a lot of voices, but I don't think that they're the, the average uh, Utah citizen or American citizen. So I, I appreciate that, you've been, that you're willing to, to be here tonight. What I'd like to do tonight is uh, explain uh, a couple experiences in my life. One has to do with freedom, and one has to do with socialized medicine, and uh, they are related. I grew up in Provo. Uh, I grew up attending the Freedom Festival where I would uh, each year hear inspiring stories of people that had uh, paid tremendous uh, prices for freedom. I met, I met a gentleman that had windsurfed from Cuba to Florida, uh, Victor Bolinko, who had flown a, a, a MiG, a Soviet MiG, defected, the family that flew the balloon uh, from East Germany over to West Germany. And so I grew up in a patriotic family. My dad served in Vietnam. Uh, so I didn't see my dad from when I was one year to two years old. And so I always uh, was instilled with that importance of freedom. When I was 16 years old, I had the opportunity to go on a BYU semester abroad. Uh, I applied to BYU early. Um, fortunately, I did well in school. And so I got accepted to BYU early and spent six months uh, in Vienna. And the experience that had the most dramatic impact on me, this was in 1982, was a, was a time when we went to uh, West Berlin. Uh, we took a train uh, through, and you had to go through East Germany to get to West Berlin. And uh, my first experience was is uh, my friend uh, happened to lean out the window and take a picture as the, as, uh, the East Germans ran dogs underneath the trains. Because since the train had gone through East Germany, they didn't want anybody to, to climb on the train and then ride it to, to West uh, Berlin. Well. He was quickly detained and realized that he shouldn't be taking pictures. The excuse was there was a military facility. But they didn't want that inhumaneness to be known uh, publicly. And so the next day, uh, we took a tour of East Berlin. And uh, we had an East German tour guide. And she took us to these buildings. This, uh, I'll, I'll never forget this museum and the shopping center as if it, they were some big deal. Uh, and told us about the wonders of socialism. But I noticed that we kept driving up and down the main street. And that's all we went when we were in West Berlin. And so we went home, or we went to the border, the East German tour guide, even though she had been diligent, given us the propaganda, she had to get off the bus, and we crossed the border back into West Berlin. Well, the next day, two friends and I decided that we hadn't seen the real uh, East Berlin. And so I will never forget going to East, or to Checkpoint Charlie, asking an American soldier, how do, how do we get a visa to go to East Berlin? And he said, walk across that line. And there was literally a line in the ground. On one side, I was free. And one side, on the other side, I could be shot if I did something. And so I walked across. And I, I, uh, this East German guard looked at me in with binoculars. We paid our money. They were desperate for, for uh, Western currency. And then we were uh, allowed to roam the city. Well, I so soon learned why we had gone up and down the main street. Because once you were off the main street, it was like you had stepped back 40 years in time. There were still bullet holes. This was in 1982. There were still bullet holes in a lot of the buildings from World War II. The, the, the sh stores that we went to were half, uh, the shelves were half empty. There was ugly produce. And literally after about three hours, I told my friends I couldn't take it anymore. I was suffocating. Literally, you could feel the oppression. And I told them that, that we had to leave. It was almost like I needed to breathe. And I remember going back to the border. Uh, usually, you know, it's, when you cross the border, you just show your passport and walk through. Well, not here. The, the guard would look at me, look at my passport, look at me. And I literally had to remind myself, Chris, if you run, you will be shot. <laughs> and it seemed like an eternity. Uh, and finally, they let us through. Well, that was my first experience with socialism. Well, fast forward uh, 1992, I graduated with my master's from BYU in organization behavior and international relations. And I didn't want to go to corporate America. So since I'd always had a fascination with U.S.-Soviet relations, uh, I found a teaching job there. And uh, I stepped off the plane. Uh, there was a beautiful young lady holding up a sign with, with my name on it. Uh, I ended up marrying her five months later. 
I figured if I'd gone through seven years of BYU with not getting married, uh, the Lord was going to have to do something a little bit more. And there was a beautiful girl with, with, with my, you know, holding a sign with my name on it. But uh, when we got married, my dad came over for, for, the, for, the, uh, uh, for the marriage, or for the wedding. Uh, and for the first five months that I was there, I rented a room from, she was chief of surgery at a hospital. And she needed actually the extra rent. Uh, that, that I had given her, even though she was chief of surgery. And so uh, my dad, uh, she gave my dad a tour of the hospital. Now here's somebody that had been a MASH doctor in Vietnam. So he'd seen less than sterile conditions. And yet my dad was literally green when he left that hospital. Uh, and, and he told me, Chris, if you ever get on the sick, you crawl on the plane and get west. <laughs> this, is, this, this is what socialized medicine uh, produces. Well, again, fast forward another 10 years after that. Uh, this was in 2002. I now had two children. My wife uh, had gone over to visit her family three weeks before I, I went, took the two kids. Uh, and so I showed up expecting my wife uh, to meet me at the bus station when, when I was there. And I was told by my father-in-law that my wife was homesick or was sick. And so I assumed she was back at the apartment. While I get there, her mother's in tears, uh, and I find out that she's just had some surgery. Well, the, the thought of my dad going, uh, uh, reminding me, Chris, if you ever get sick, you go west, and just think that my wife was having surgery there. And my Russian is not all that great, but I did figure out fallopian tube that was probably in that topic of pregnancy, that she had, you know, probably ruptured the, the fallopian tube and was probably bleeding internally. Well, uh, the next morning, uh, I went to the hospital to visit her. And I uh, go down this hallway with bricks on the ground without, without very good mortar. So you know that it's impossible to get sterile, you know, if there's cracks. And I go into the room, and there's a room with eight women with beds against the wall. And there's my beautiful wife uh, lying on, on this bed with dingy gray. Uh, and, and I'm a little bit ashamed, but I, but I am weak. I, I I had to walk out, sit on the ground, and stick my head between my legs because I would have passed out. But, but here is this room. You could just it, in in the hospitals here, you uh, you can just smell that it's clean. There, you could just smell that it wasn't clean. And you know, fortunately, they, you know, they did save my wife's life. But uh, but but to see her in that situation. And, uh, and everybody says that it'll be equal care. Well, the one thing, my, my, mother, my mother-in-law is very good at the system because if you want real care, you have to pay extra money. So we had to pay extra money. Uh, you know, we got our private room. But what would, literally would happen is you would get it, the doctor would tell you what supplies you needed and then you'd have to go downstairs and then buy them. You know, even though it was supposedly free, there was, there was really two different systems. Uh, you know, you, you had to pay the doctor to get the special, you know, the special treatment. Uh, fortunately, uh, it worked out well for us, but, you know, I still live in fear to this day. Um, you know, the, my kids were out, I took my kids to the hospital, they were out playing, and my four or three-year-old son comes with this needle, you know, and, and trying to explain, ask my son if he'd been pricked, he'd pricked himself or things like that, but it was just, uh, it is not a good system. Socialism destroys uh, the individual, it weakens the family, and it eventually destroys the society as well. And regardless of what they say, you know, the, the goal may be uh, you know, equality, but under the Soviet system there were two sets of hospitals. The political elite had one hospital, everybody else had another hospital, and then the other hospital depended on how much you could pay which coverage you've got. And so that, that is even a fallacy that it will be equal, equality. There will be two systems, different systems. I just took my daughter to uh, back to school uh, night uh, on Wednesday night, and her teacher was from England. And we just started talking. Uh, and most things in my life, they eventually turned to politics. And she just started criticizing the, the British system. You know, she just barely had come back uh, a number of years ago, but her husband was 42 needed a hip replacement, and they wanted him to wait until 65, because they only wanted to give him one. 
had to, uh, for his crutches, he had to hobble a half mi uh, a quarter mile to the other end of the building. He'd forgotten his note, and he had to hobble back and then back uh, to get his crutches. No customer service. Uh, it is it is something that we cannot allow to happen this this country. It's more than just about health care, though. It, it is about it is about basic freedoms, about our uh, choices, what we value. Uh, what we have done here in the state, uh, a number of us have felt so strongly about uh, what Washington is doing. We do really do believe that the states are kind of the last line of defense. Uh, I'm a big believer in the Tenth Amendment. And so we've started the Patrick Henry Caucus, which is uh, a caucus where we're meeting with other legislators. We have about 200 legislators from around the country and are trying to, to coordinate and pass similar laws to take some of those rights back to the states. That should be a Utah state. Right, it shouldn't be a federal uh, right. And so, uh, Alexander Hamilton said, the state legislators who will always be not only vil uh, vigilant, but suspicious and jealously, jealous guardians of the rights of citizens against encroachments from the federal government will constantly have their attention awake to the conduct of their national rulers and will be ready enough, if anything improper appears, to sound the alarm of the people and not only be the voice but if necessary, the arm of their discontent. I'm here to sound the alarm. There is a problem with Washington. And so I encourage you to let not only Senator Bennett and Senator Hatch and whoever your representative is know that you don't like what's going on, but also let your local, your Utah State representative and your Utah State uh, Senator know that you feel very strongly about state rights and that you want them to do something to protect states' rights. Again, I'm grateful for having the opportunity to be here. I'm grateful that you were here. But uh, I think sometimes we think that the Patriots, the Patriots were long ago. That happened in 1775, 1776. Uh, there, there, we have a time that we need to, to stand up. I've had it pretty cushy most of my life. I've, I've uh, enjoyed the benefits of my dad, my grandfather, the World War II veterans. Uh, but it's time for me to step up and it's time for you to step up. So thanks for being here tonight. Thanks.